I've been using Godot for the past couple of years now to make my games and game development is hard enough as is. So I wanted to share with you a few of the tips that I've learned along the way and things that I do day in and day out that make the engine a bit easier for me to use and make my projects a bit more stable, especially as I get to the end of a project where I'm publishing it. There's so many ways that you can break your project. So hopefully some of these things will help you out as well. The very first tip here is gonna be something that actually added in Godot 4, I believe, and it's been a really great change. And that has to do with these export variables. Export variables here are great because you can export into the UI and set things that maybe instead of setting the color to be a specific hexadecimal value, you can then see through the editor what the color looks like. And for me, I like to visualize it. I don't know if you think in hexadecimal, but I surely don't. So I like to visualize visualize some of the export variables I'm setting. But if you're also like me, sometimes you have maybe upwards of 100 plus export variables to find it in a class, and then the inspector gets a bit unwieldy. Now you can use this new notation called at export group, slap in a string there for the name, and we'll just save both of these here. And all of a sudden, you have these nice little um, folders that you can uncheck or recheck. And if I wanted to come down here to my card rarity colors, I could change the colors, the weights based off of the export variables I have, and then minimize it to push it away. You can do this all over the place. And in fact, if you want to know more about some of this export notation, you can just control click on export group. It'll bring up more information about how you can use this. You can even go and do subgroups if you're interested to. But the docs are right there in the engine if you want to go through and read all the different great things you can do with export variables. Tip number two is going to help you with the organization of your various scenes, whether that's building hundreds of user interface nodes like myself and creating all those control nodes or something more complicated just by having a core component with a bunch of sub components inside of it. One of the things you'll inevitably be doing is referencing some of these scenes within your uh, the, the, the core script of the given scene. And the old way of doing that is with a dollar sign notation and then a long path for the actual reference to where it is located in the scene. But this falls victim to the fact that I like to change stuff, especially with a user interface. I'm monkeying with where VBoxes should be or HBoxes or if this control node should be here or if I need a margin container. So if you were to change any of these references within this, uh, this path, it'll instantly break your code. It'll You'll run it, it'll yell at you, you'll call you a dumb monkey and say, hey, go back and change this. So one of the things they added in Godot is the ability to have a percent sign. If you right click on it and grab this access as unique name, you can then do just that. You can drag it over, oh, let me, uh, you can drag it over here and you have a percent sign and then the name of the node. And as long as you don't change the name of the node, you can move this to anywhere in this scene and it'll keep using it correctly. Then you can call percent sign the name and you can go ahead and say show if you wanted to show your control node or whatever method you wanted to call inside of it or logic or properties you wanted to change. The percent sign is your best friend. I haven't found a drawback to it quite yet. If you do know a drawback, if there's some performance gain or something crazy like that. I'm not a big brain person. I just know that this has made my projects a lot more robust. And as a silly monkey like myself, anything I can do to protect myself from myself is a win in my book. Before we get into the next tip, I want to let you know that I want this channel to be a place where we can connect about game development and talk about the actual act of making games. One of my goals for this channel is to be a game developer who makes YouTube videos, not a YouTuber who makes games. And I think that distinction is important. So in, because of that, I'm not taking sponsorships. I did one before, it felt icky. And so instead of that, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and check out my games over on Steam. I already have one game that's on sale right now called Chess Survivors, which is a super fun game that I'm incredibly proud about. But if you really wanna help, go check out Hexagod. Play the demo. It is by far the best game I've made. I think you'd like it, but if not, you hanging out here watching the video is good enough for me. So let's get back into the, the tips. Syntax can be hard. These on ready variables, I never remember do, where do I put the colon or where do I put you know the resource name and, and kind of all that different stuff. So instead of having to remember that every time you can control and click and drag out the uh, the actual click to paste in basically the syntax for you for an on ready variable. It'll turn any of the spaces into underscores. It's not a huge time saver, but it could save you some weird bugs and stuff like that. And if you want to grab a bunch of them, you could control click and drag out a bunch and boom, you got your on ready variables ready to go for you. Just in, I guess, a few clicks. There you go. Tip number four here is going to be talking about something I've learned from object-oriented programming, and that is getters and setters. But what I didn't know is how easy it is to use getters and setters in Godot. They add this in where now I have the ability to just quickly, with the definition of the variable, add in the setter. And this has kind of changed the way I approach 
um, variables and designs like that. Because before I used to have a whole method that says like set villager state, I'd pass in the value, I'd do the changing, and I'd have to always remember what did I name my setter. But now because I've added in the setter for this state based off of it, in a different script, if I call this, or even in the same script, I call villager.state equals this value, it'll go ahead and run the rest of this code. You simply do that by adding a colon at the end of the, uh, the definition of the variable. You add in set, and then you give a name to that value that's gonna be passed in. In this case, I use new state, another colon, and then you can start doing logic in here. Now, the key thing is at some point, if you do wanna change it to the new state, you can go ahead and make sure you say the variable name equals then the value that got passed in. I sometimes forget this, and it does it's one of those moments where once you figure out that that's why you broke it, it definitely makes you like smash your head against your keyboard. Just remember to add it in and uh, it'll make sure that it actually changes it. But then you can add in a bunch of logic. You can call other functions and stuff like that. And it just, it looks so clean in other scripts when you say the, the name of the object you're changing, variable you're changing, and then the name. It just, it keeps it clean. It keeps it simple. You can also do this for getters, but I've had a lot of success in my current project, Hexagod, of just using a bunch of setters all over the place. I use it a bunch and it just, it just simply works. My next tip for you is gonna to be to use more enums in your code. An enum is simply a definition of a bunch of values like this. So just before here, we were talking about our villager states. I have defined an idle state, a travel to target state, a working state, and a collecting state. This helps me define a bunch of different states so that I can have a very simple state machine for if we're doing idle, what sort of animation am I doing, or am I having a thought bubble above, or what am I doing when a villager is in this state? But it's also very useful for defining different types of things in your game. So I have a bunch of enums defined here for card types and tile types and stuff like that. You can then go a bit further and even use these enums as keys for your translations. If you want to know more about them, I would highly suggest searching enum online to learn about them. For me, they're the cornerstone of what keeps my project uh, referencing across the board. So that if I'm talking about a food type of resource in a bunch of different places, whether it's the UI, the code, or even in the, the visual aspects of rendering sprites, I know that I'm talking about food. And so I can use that as the anchor for the different types of resources inside my game. My last tip for you is gonna be something to do with shaders. Now I have this effect which helps me dissolve the shader out using this dissolve value. Changing it from one down to zero will slowly dissolve it out using some random noise. I'm using a tween method to tween this value. I'm specifically grabbing the material out using the sh shader parameter and passing in the name of the, uh, the parameter there to actually get that dissolve to happen then in code where in the editor you can just slide the value around to see what it would look like. Now, if you asked me to explain exactly how this shader code work, I would say it was magic. And that's what it feels like to me. Shaders feel like magic. But luckily for those, uh, maybe those shader muggles like myself, there is GodotShaders.com. Specifically, I grabbed this shader from one that Mr. Liptic sent out, who also has a great channel. And uh, Mr. Lipteach is also a great channel for learning Godot stuff. So links to those below. But Godot Shaders has a bunch of different types of shaders that can help the non-shader magically inclined people like myself uh, understand and start using shaders to make their games look that much better. So hopefully this site can help you at least get your teeth, uh, sink your teeth into what shaders could do. And maybe if you're like me, you'll slowly learn how to use the magic yourself and change things and tweak them just a little bit so they'll work better for you. The last thing I wanna leave you with here is that your game has to just barely work. So don't spend your time making some technical uh, marvel that you're gonna write a PhD paper about. It just has to work. I've released a bunch of prototypes and game jam games, and I've even done two commercial games. Well, I guess I'm working on my second commercial game right now called Hexagod, and I just watched Reformation play it over on his YouTube channel, which was super fun. But my biggest takeaway is that he didn't run into any bugs as he's playing it, because I know deep down inside, I know all of the bugs. I know how much duct tape is just barely holding the game together. So just spend your time making the game good enough and making it fun. And I, I promise if you keep iteratively getting better and better and better, you two will be releasing that game over on Steam before you know it. I've been Aramis. I hope you learned something new here. If you have any questions below, leave them down in the comments. Go play Hexagod. But until next time, have a great day. Bye-bye.